computer. Patrick Kelly, this is Gordon and Janet. Hello. Hi, how are you? Doing okay. <laughs> We're live from an undisclosed location on a mountaintop in the middle of the Maine coast looking out at 300 islands in the Gulf of Maine. Right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am speaking from London, and I'm Crystal from uh, Physique. Welcome to Physique's 39th meeting. I am going to share screen so I would be able to present Physique properly. We can share screen now. Okay. Welcome to Physique, the Free Energy Special Interest Group. This is our 39th meeting, and today is the 19th of July, 2017. The meeting is supposed to start at 7.30 sharp, but we are having a bit of a low attack today, so it's starting five minutes later, four minutes later. So here we are. Can you hear me better with, the, um, with my headset? I guess you can. Hi. Mm -hmm. I think it's better, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it is, isn't it? So the recording would be better with this right now. This is blocking my... So if you want to know what physics is about, please go to our website. It's uh, truevisionofpeace.com slash physique, F-E-S-I-G dot H-T-M-L. And uh, read about our mission, our statement, and everything that is to read about that we do in physics. Today's meeting agenda is a quick presentation of physics, which I have been doing time and again for all the meetings. And uh, we have introduced to each other the new members here in this meeting, and we're going to carry on. Okay, so, and uh, I am chairing this meeting. Um, I would invite James Rink to co chair with me because he is very familiar with. Uh, the ET part of the conversation because he's been like a ringleader of the super soldier, super soldiers, uh, and he's very well with on the uh, secret space program. Um, but he's not here today yet. I guess um, he's usually in the meetings, but um, well, we'll see. Anyway, so the speakers we have today is uh, God, uh, Gordon James Ganinotto. Uh, Jay, uh, Gordon has been on over 700 broadcasts, including his own radio shows, satellite, shortwave, and internet radio stations with between 20 to 50 million listeners of his inspiring descriptions of our future. Now, I will go into a bit more detail about uh, who he is and who Janet is when I uh, will be introducing him properly a little bit later, okay? So once we have finished the uh, talk with uh, James, uh, with Gordon and uh, Janet, then the, the panel from Physic will join in the conversation and then we will have question and answers and then we will have our Physic meeting and we will adjourn to the next meeting on the 2nd of August when uh, Patrick J. Kelly of A Practical Guide to Free Energy Devices speaks at Physics 40th meeting. Uh, Patrick has authored more than 200 e-books and has dedicated his work, 3,300 pages of his site to educational study and research for free energy uh, enthusiasts, special interest it, well, it's a special interest group, and we are very grateful and thankful that Patrick is supporting our cause. And I, I wish to uh, invite him to join the Executive Council, if he may. <laughs> right, so this is the agenda, and um, if you need to, I mean, you want to join Physic, please write into crystal at truevisionofpeace.com, that's me, and... I will then uh, put you into the database and you will receive reports of the meetings and uh, whatever that you need to know on the uh, development of our activities. That's it. Now I'm gonna, I've stopped sharing. I'm going into the uh, meeting 
uh, introduction of the speakers now. Uh, okay, I think Ron is um, on the video now. I don't know what's wrong. It's just showing Ron's empty chair. Let's have a look. I think his doorbell rang and he went to get the door. Ah, there you I'm go. Sure. I'm, 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 I, I'm glad you speak up, Janet. Yeah, I'm going to introduce you, Janet and Gordon, in a minute. Just give me a moment. Okay, now I got it. Gordon has studied astronomy, astrophysics, and space science, aerospace engineering, psychology, and law. Gordon is also a licensed shortwave radio operator and beekeeper and worked as a commercial fisherman and contractor. In a lifetime of many psychic telepath, telepathic and ET experiences, he had visions of pole shift since 1973. Gordon and Janet, Janet Louis Stanley, his wife of 27 years, live on a mountaintop blueberry farm on the main coast. Janet is a naturalist, a psychic, and a shaman with many ET contacts herself. Uh, well, with over three dozen close up physical experiences with ET ships, she has, together with her husband, Gordon, had spacecraft and ETs in their dooryard and in their house. Millions of people around the world have heard her descriptions of um, visitations with extraterrestrials and her relationship with her 100% human unselfish extraterrestrial Zeta hybrid children. So for more than 20 years, they have lectured widely on the approach of Planet X, post shift and the aftermath, including open contact with benevolent ETs and dimensional or frequency change for Earth. They have uh, UFOs, ETs in their yard, as I mentioned earlier, in their house, everywhere around them. And it's like the East Coast ET Ranch, whilst James Gilliland's ET Ranch uh, is on the uh, northwest coast of the USA. So Gordon speaks of ET contact, telepathy, psychic experiences and visions as he described how we are about to experience pole shifts, the crust of the planet separating from the core and reattaching. The event will bring unimagined challenges to our lives. Gordon has been on over 700 broadcasting, I mean broadcasts, including his own radio shows, satellite shortwave and internet radio stations, with between 20 to 50 million listeners of his inspiring descriptions of our future. So now I will call upon, oh, before I, I call you, to the stand with the microphone. I just want to briefly report on the last meeting. Physics, last meeting, the 38th meeting on the uh, 5th of July, we had uh, Elizabeth Donovan, who brought many insights into the realm of free energy development. Elizabeth has uh, presented uh, papers in high profile conferences with her peers such as Tom Bearden, Dan Winter, Greg Braden, Alex Guy, Obilensky, Mike Upstone, and others. She spoke about the politics of suppression of knowledge, philosophy, and technology, as well as um, the different energy and propulsion technology. Um, okay, so um, Please go into our website and read up more about the report to last meeting because it's been very informative. Elizabeth presented a fantastic PowerPoint presentation. And also go into our YouTube channel and you can see all the YouTubes that we had, the recordings of all the meetings of physique since we started from day one. So uh, you can uh, watch all those and never miss on our progress. <laughs> right, thank you so much. And now over to you, Gordon and Janet. The microphone is yours. Well, it's a pleasure being here, first of all. And uh, although we've been on many saucers, we probably don't have the exact information that you're looking for, but I have a lot more information that you really need to hear. Uh, that I want to share with you, but uh, 
Janet and I were, we just did a search on Google for Gordon and Janet, just that. And we found our pictures all over the place. There were a lot of other Gordons and a lot of other Janets and even some Gordons and Janets, but we're there. And you can do a search for Gordon plus, like the mathematical plus sign, Planet X, and you'll find all kinds of pictures of Planet X. And right in the middle of the Google images, you'll see pictures of me. We were searching on the internet and we realized that probably a hundred million people have listened to us because we found website after website after website where people took snips of interviews and posted them. And we couldn't believe how much that was. And I've done, um, uh, this is going to be my 156th show this Friday night. I have a show on the internet. It's called The Whole Agenda and it's on, um, an internet radio station. I have over a million listeners and it's on every Friday night at midnight Eastern time till 2 a.m. Saturday uh, on Freedom's Lips, which is spell spelled the same as Freedom Slips. And there's 90 hosts in two studios and I'm on Studio A at midnight on Friday night Eastern. And um, I've been on Coast to Coast AM five times and uh, all kinds of other live broadcasts in over 160 countries around the world. So there's a lot of people who have heard of me and Janet. And uh, I want to say that we're live from an undisclosed location because I really don't want people to know uh, where I am. But uh, we do have a mailing address if people wish to make donations, and that's in Ellsworth, Maine. It's P.O. Box 51. Ellsworth, E-L-L-S-W-O-R-T-H, Ellsworth, Maine, which is M-E, and the zip code is 04605. We're bouncing along the bottom of the Social Security uh, pay scale here, so we don't even have siding on our house after 17 years, so it would be nice if somebody liked what we had to say and wanted to support it, that they would uh, donate by sending um, some money or a check or a money order, whatever to P.O. Box 51, Ellsworth, Maine, 04605. And I don't want to give my phone number out on this show because it's going to be posted on the internet, but I give permission for any of you to ask Crystal for my phone number and she can give it to you and you're all welcome to call me and discuss anything you want. I have a Skype uh, page and it's Noto, all in lowercase. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that I'm going to mention that would be of interest to you. And the first thing that I talk about on my radio show, I talk about four things. And that is the coming apocalypse caused by Planet X, the change to um, um, uh, open contact with ETs that's coming, uh, unselfish ETs. And then um, the uh, change of dimension, the whole Earth is going to become an unselfish fourth dimensional planet. And then um, finally, uh, human hybrids are going to join us on the Earth. And uh, they've been selecting very emotional and intelligent people on Earth and breeding with them because their cloning is failing. After millions of years, their cloning is failing. And they did DNA tests and discovered our DNA matches theirs perfectly. So for years, they've been breeding uh, hybrids, half, half human from Earth and half humans from uh, Zeta Reticuli and the Zetas destroyed their planetary system and they decided they already had space travel and they decided that uh, in the future they probably didn't deserve to have a planet and that they would uh, clone themselves and remove all sexual organs from their bodies and eliminate their emotional nature and so they're extremely telepathic they can't speak they can only send pictures mentally, and uh, they have uh, no ears but openings for, for sound, and they have uh, small mouths, and they don't eat. They, they eat by painting nutrients on their skin, uh, like chlorophyll. So they uh, were sent here to study us, and they treated us like lab rats at first. But then when their cloning started to fail, they realized, oh, my God, what are we going to do? We're gonna, we could create a half, uh, a half human from Earth and select all the people who were emotional and, and intelligent. And the reason why is they realize now they made a big mistake 
by cutting out sex because they thought sex leads to, to bad emotions like jealousy and greed. And then that leads to war and that leads to the destruction of planets. And instead, now they meeting with us, they see that um, good emotions and good sex and, uh, and, and sexual organs are uh, the way to go. So Janet has been taken up many, many times on a Zeta ships and impregnated with a male Zeta um, sperm. And then she comes back and uh, she has a dream of being on a table with long necked horses. They sort of create screen memory so you can't really remember everything in case that would cause you trouble. And then six weeks later, they come back and take the baby. And I guess after six weeks, they raise it in a test tube. I really don't know the exact procedure. But Janet has been taken up many times so that her children could meet their mother and she could meet her children. And some of her children were old enough that they asked her, would you like to take a trip around the solar system on a flying saucer? Well, Janet was never going to refuse that. So she's had some really interesting experiences. Now, the way this, the way this started is, as children, we both had experiences with ETs. At the time, we didn't realize that they were, but they both started for each of us about about uh, when we were five years old. And um, in 1964, I was with my brother and my mother on a ferry in San Juan Harbor. And uh, we saw a mothership a mile in diameter, flat on the bottom, like the top half of a, of a, of a sphere, a hemisphere. It was like the top half of a grapefruit and it was glowing bright orange. And it sort of materialized out of uh, a cloudless sky as a little gray spot and as the spot got bigger it seemed like the sun was going to rise behind the spot and out came this huge mile diameter mothership bright orange and it sat there for a little while and then it opened a huge door that you couldn't see any detail it was like milk glass lit by an orange light bulb and then all of a sudden the door on the side of it opened and three flying saucers zoomed out through that opening and headed east over the atlantic and then the door closed and then it sort of winked out like a dimmer switch. And uh, I said to my mother, do you realize what we just saw? And I was uh, 15 at the time. And um, she goes, well, that was interesting, but what's for dinner? And I said, the hell with dinner. I mean, do you realize what the government is covering up? They've got to know all about this. So then, and that was in 1964. In 1968, I decided that I would teach myself telepathy and contact aliens. So I used to walk outside and look up at the stars. And I said, I know that there's the good, the bad and the ugly. And I only want to be contacted by the good. And I kept doing that for 20 years. And in 1988, I was driving in a car uh, nor north of uh, here. And um, I received a telepathic message. We're on a saucer and we're coming to take you on board. And it was a 150 foot disc with a flashing red, white, and blue light in the top center and a flashing red, white, and blue light in the bottom center and two huge pontoons that were 100 feet long and 30 feet in diameter. They had huge railroad train-like spotlights at the end of each cylinder. And it looked like the saucer could land on the ocean and float on its pontoons. And they took me aboard and I met humans from the Pleiades. I don't need um, to interrupt, uh, Gordon. Do I start showing the pictures now? No, no, no. Okay. I'll start. I'm going to Give start talking about when you want me to. Okay. In any moment. So then I was talking to a psychic, and she said, "You know, you've never had a partner on your wavelength. Why don't you ask the Space Brothers?" So I started walking outside, and I I'm six foot two, and I'm half Scottish and half Sicilian, and I thought I know what I like, and uh, so I'm gonna as long as I'm asking, why not be specific? So I said. <laughs> got to be six feet tall at least. She's got to be half Scottish, half Scandinavian, blue eyes, reddish hair, a great sense of humor, psychic, sees UFOs, love animals, especially cats, and uh, believes in a less is more lifestyle. And, uh, and then a year later, I went. We've been together for 27 years. So, um, I, we had one date and I asked her to move in the next day. And so that's how that started. But that's, that's thanks to the ETs. So 
that bio is kind of old and I would say that at least 48 times we've had flying saucers in our yard or we've been somewhere where we saw things. And I want to say that we've never seen the same thing twice. Every single ship is different. She saw a triangle, which I've never seen. There was like three city buses uh, parked to, in a triangle. That's the size and the thickness of it. And, um, and then we've seen cotton balls, needles, uh, cigar shaped ships, discs of all kinds and colors. We've seen, um, I saw a top hat just like Abraham Lincoln wore hovering outside my house where we used to live. And uh, um, little faint little green lights flickering on and off all the way around it. And then one night, Janet was having a, a lucid dream where she was on a saucer and she was talking to the Zetas and I was talking to the praying mantises. And they're human, they're mammalian, but they were wearing robes so that they wouldn't startle, their appearance wouldn't startle too much or scare. And they're the real scientists of, of the galaxies who are here. And they uh, um, were talking to me about mathematics and all kinds of stuff, which I don't even remember. And Janet said to the Zetas, I'd like to see you for real, not just in my dreams. And it was June 9th. 1991 and she woke up and went downstairs at four in the morning and opened the door uh went to close the the inner door and uh the screen door was still there and it was a little cool she looked out there was a saucer in our yard so she woke me up she says gordon 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 there's a flying saucer in our yard and so i said well it's got to be the northern lights and she goes no it's a flying saucer so i'll go okay so i went downstairs and there was a a 35 foot disc hovering just above a 15 foot maple tree and it was like a canoe in a harbor it was sort of rocking gently and it was nickel colored and it had a dome on top that was nickel colored and as it rocked you could see the dome and sometimes you couldn't see the dome and it was just sort of like like trying to maintain a, a, a static position but it was rocking slightly and it ionized the air around the disc was ionized bright orange. And the air around the dome of the disc was ionized bright red. And it was beautiful. And we stood there 50 feet from it and watched it. And it was like being in the presence of unconditional love. It was an awesome spiritual experience. And uh, it was just, uh, you know, it was everything that, you know, you'd ever want if you wanted to see a flying saucer. There it was in front of us. And we watched it for about 20 minutes and then it zoomed off. And that was the beginning of our uh, maybe 48 times that we've had things like that happen. So they come through the wall and Janet can see on the fourth dimension. So when they come through the wall, she sees them. And uh, I don't see them, but I, I uh, can ask, talk to them telepathically. Now, uh, I'm going to get on to Planet X right now. Planet X is a 29,000 mile diameter planet streaming out twin tails. And each tail is made up of moons from very large to very small that rotate like a vortex in a blender. If you've ever put oh, food, water, or fruit in a blender, or ice cream, whatever, and you turn it on and you look down there, you can look all the way down to the blades because of the rotation of the of whatever you're pulverizing. Well, the tails of Planet X are just like that. They're, they have a rotation, and the rotation in the tail, each tail is separate, um, is such that it acts like it creates a hollow space in the dust of the tail. Now, the planet, Planet X, is volcanic, oceanic, and atmospheric, and it has a very selfish race that is called the Anunnaki. And they're written up completely by Zechariah Sitchin in a series of books, which you should read if you're interested at all. And they came to Earth and they pretended to be God and gods and plural. And the story of making mankind is from that time because the Anunnaki are the ones who bred us. And they bred us to be smart enough to be good gold mining slaves and defective enough that we wouldn't know that we are gods too and that we're equal to them. So they discovered uh, about a million, well, millions of years ago that they needed to keep their planet warmer because where they come from, 
has just recently been found and it's labeled planet nine. And that's, it's wrong. It's not a planet. It's the burnt out cinder of the twin of our sun. And it goes back and forth between that sun and our sun. And it takes 3,757 years during which time it approaches the speed of light. So there's a lot of things to this that scientists don't understand um, that you could approach the speed of light. Um, and so they come back every 3,657 years. Now, I've got to start with this because uh, you've been told a lie for 400 years. You've been told that gravity pulls. And I want to tell you right now, I discovered this in, in, uh, the, uh, in the 80s, 1980s, thinking about the propulsion systems of flying saucers. And I realized that gravity pushes. And that's why you never hear urgent meetings of astronomers saying, uh, we've got to do something about these colliding moons and colliding planets and colliding stars. People think we're in the Milky Way, but we're actually in the Sagittarius galaxy. And the Sagittarius galaxy is cutting through the Milky Way, the edge of the Milky Way, like a buzzsaw. And I find it just remarkable that all these years people would look up at the Milky Way in the summer and realize that it went north to south instead of following the plane of the ecliptic and going from east to west. Because we're all familiar, the sun rises in the east, goes south, and then sets in the west. Uh, and then at night, you look at the, at the Milky Way, and it's from north to south. And they only discovered, I think it was in 2008 or 2009, that we're not in the Milky Way. We're in the Sagittarius galaxy. And 30,000 years from now, when you look up at the night sky, the Milky Way will be a distant little, little patch. But it won't be like it is now. So anyway, this planet comes through, and that's why it doesn't collide with anything. And it's not going to collide with Earth. What it does is it approaches from the direction of Orion, and that's why the NASA patches on their shoulders show the three stars of Orion's belt. That's a little secret message for insiders. And it was first uh, noticed the, the uh, Zetas from the Roswell crash told the U.S. government that Planet X is approaching and that uh, it would be here. So in 1983, they sent up the infrared astronomical satellite and it photographed Planet X um, approaching the solar system. And the other person who was gonna be on today, but not, isn't now, his name is Conrad Zeidervelt. And he was one of a dozen astronomers on Earth who actually rented telescopes and actually saw Planet X before it, it got uh, came into the inner solar system. So, um, you know, there were the Zetas, I've got to tell you, the Zetas contacted this woman, Nancy Leader, and they changed, did something with her brain so she could receive telepathic uh, messages from them. And since 1995, she has taken questions from the public, asked them of the Zetas, and then typed them out and put them on her website, zetatalk.com. So if you go to zetatalk.com, you will see 40,000 pages of questions from the public and answers from the Zetas. And so about, I don't know how many million years ago, the Anunnaki went to Mars to mine gold because there was... Uh, it was too much of a problem with the dinosaurs and the jungles and the snakes and everything else uh, to be here on Earth. So they were mining uh, gold on Mars by sluicing it using the, the, uh, the seas, the shallow brackish seas that were on Mars. And they drained all that water into the inner crust of Mars where it still is. They didn't think to bring pumps or a nuclear reactor and pump the water to dredge the gold. Uh, they just drained the oceans into the inner caverns. And once that happened, the climate changed. And while they were there, they built pyramids and cities, and there's all kinds of stuff. In that collection of pictures, which I gave permission to Crystal to make copies of it available to you, I guess on the website, Crystal, is that how you're going to do it? Uh, 
I will put a link on the website later, but now I can show it. Once you give me the cue, I'm going to show it now, yeah. shall I? So, you know, if you want to, because uh, I'm not going to explain each picture, but I'm going to explain about the pictures. And from that, you'll know what you're looking at. So uh, one of the pictures is a picture of the ground and Mars, and there's a piece of gold jewelry on the ground. And that's from the time the Anunnaki were here. Now, just before uh, Jesus was born, they kicked the Anunnaki off Earth, and Planet X wasn't in the solar system, so they couldn't go back to Planet X. So instead, uh, they went to Mars, and being, I guess they're stupid. I, I just don't know how to, else to put it. If they had brought elk, because there's lichen growing on the rocks in Mars, and they went to the deepest crater, which is called the Gale Crater, on Mars, and that's where we sent our Curiosity rover, and that's why if you look through these pictures, you're gonna find all kinds of anomalies, buildings, communication towers, jewelry, uh, rock drills, holes, skeletons of humans. You're gonna see skeletons of sheep and goats. If they had brought elk, they would have been able to lick the lichen, but they brought sheep and goats, and they were gonna wait, um, you know, uh, 2,000 years for Planet X to come back, and the sheep and goats ate all the hay, and uh, then there was no more food, and then they all died. So that was how they ended. But they're still there on Planet X. Now, Planet X was photographed in 1983, and JPL announced that they had found, it was on the headline of the Washington Post, the LA Times, every newspaper in the country, that Planet X had been discovered, which I guess you could say Planet 10, but they all call it Planet X. And it's Nibiru from the Sumerians. And it had, um, yeah, that's a piece of jewelry, gold, lost wax processed jewelry that was photographed by the Curiosity rover just laying on the surface of Mars. But if you go to those pictures, you'll be astounded at the things you see there, including statues and pyramids and buildings, even a sphinx. Um, so it's an, it's an amazing thing. Uh, so anyway, they, this, this comes through the solar system every 3,600 years. So... What they did was they, they set up mining in Mars, and then when they would come back, they would transfer the gold to a space station and from the space station to Planet X. But then when they ruined the atmosphere in Mars by draining the oceans, instead what they did was uh, move to Earth. And they needed slaves, so they the primates and bred them on the moon in laboratories to create the human race with atrophied pineal glands. So that was so that you wouldn't know you were part of the creator. Um, so we're basically all creators in training, even them. And the way I explain that, and I think you'll benefit from this, is that imagine you're the creator and you haven't done anything. You haven't started at all. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, I can do anything. And I know everything. And then you're thinking, wow, I'm stopped. I can't take a next step. This is it as far as I can go. And then you get this idea, what if I create a universe and break myself up into trillions of parts and send parts of me out to, to inhabit all the parts of the universe? So souls came first to different planets as rocks, and they were just conscious that they were alive. They were feeling the wind and the weather and the vibration of the planet. And then they graduated to plants. And when they figured out how to think, uh, like the Venus flytrap can catch flies, um, when they learned how to think, then they uh, progressed into the animal kingdom. And then when they get smart enough, they get to be reincarnated as pets and be with humans. And the next step after that is to be born as a human. So there's a process, but we're all uh, conscious and we all like appreciation and and uh, we all can contact each other so we are creators in training equal to anybody that's on planet x and in fact they're so selfish that actually the people on earth the unselfish people have progressed farther than they have so earth is going to become a fourth dimensional planet but planet x is not going to become a fourth dimensional planet so then it was approaching the solar system and they tried to take pictures of it with the Hubble telescope and they realized they couldn't focus that close or whatever the problem was. Bill Clinton was president and he ordered an immediate fix to the Hubble telescope 
you remember they went up and they fixed the Hubble telescope. Uh, what they were doing was making it so that it could take a picture of Planet X. And the first picture they took, which were, of course, posted on the Internet, uh, everyone thought was a picture of heaven. Well, immediately NASA deleted that picture, but enough people got copies of it that it's out there now. But I did a Google search for the picture of heaven, and I couldn't find it. They substituted some galaxy pictures, but that's not it. And what it looked like was a giant dome, golden dome in the center with a city stretching out to the right and stretching out to the left. And that's what it looks like as it approaches. It looks like a winged globe. And that, that symbol that's on Chrysler cars and is on uh, uh, pilots all wear with a globe with wings on it, that's the Sumerian symbol for Planet X. It's also called the Planet of Crossing the Comet of Destruction, and it looks pinkish because it has giant rifts on the planet that light up the sky, and it sheds hydrocarbons and iron oxide in the tail, and there's millions of rocks. So it, it came in, it approached the inner solar system in 1999, and they got some pictures of it. There's a picture of a splotch. It looks like a red drop of paint has been splattered on black background. That's the first infrared pictures from 1999 as Planet X approached the solar system. So then it went behind the sun and came out uh, around the sun in December of 2003. And when it was discovered in 1983, Ronald Reagan uh, signed an executive order making it top secret to discuss it or disclose it. And many people say I'm very brave and uh, I don't know how brave I am, but I'm so enthusiastic about the subject, I have to talk out about it, and I have. Now, uh, you've got to understand that if you, if you could uh, reach up and grab the solar system and put it on a table in front of you, that all the planets go counterclockwise around the sun, looking at from above, and all the north poles of all the planets basically point straight up north like the sun's uh, north pole of the magnetic north pole of the sun points straight up. So they're all pointing straight up. They go around the sun counterclockwise, and all of a sudden, here comes planet X around the sun. And remember, gravity pushes. And it comes around the sun, and it stops the Earth in its orbit. And it stops in its orbit because NASA has never revealed this but there is a dark twin to Earth that orbits on the opposite side of the sun, and it is uh, a burned out cylinder, cinder, and the Anunnaki have robots mining gold on the dark twin of Earth. Well, when the Earth stopped in its orbit, the dark twin caught up with the Earth in its orbit, and it was bobbing around the South Pole. So if you go to the Weimar, the German uh, Antarctic station, and look at their their videos you'll see and i have a couple of pictures there of an antarctic station on stilts and a big it looks like the moon in the background but that's the dark twin of earth nasa has never mentioned it none of the indian prophecies the hopi the navajo no none of the ancient civilizations have ever mentioned the dark twin of the earth and uh, recently it started bobbing around the northern hemisphere so people in the uk and in alabama have recently gone out after midnight and taken pictures of, uh, it looks like the, the, full, the moon lit by a reddish glow. And that's the sunlight going around the earth and reflecting on the surface, which is a black burned out cinder. And it sometimes reflects gold, sometimes it reflects blue. And I have some pictures in that group of a blue, blue orb in the sky. That's that's the dark twin of Earth. It's exactly the same size. The Earth is 7,500 miles in diameter. So is the dark twin. And, and Venus is just almost that big. And so when Planet X came around the sun, it stopped Venus, the Earth, and the dark twin from continuing counterclockwise. So it's just sitting there and gradually getting closer and closer. And right now it is... 30 million miles from Earth. It will, at the closest, come to 15 million miles uh, when full shift is caused. But uh, 
It, the search for Planet X by looking at the night sky is a joke because it's at the four o'clock position next to the sun. So it's not in between the Earth and the sun. It's just off to the right a little bit at the four o'clock position when seen from the Northern Hemisphere. And there's a green picture on there with a big green ball and a little green ball. I took that myself from this mountaintop using a welding filter and got a picture of Planet X at the four o'clock position of the sun. Now, NASA has a satellite called the Stereo Ahead and they have another satellite called the Stereo Behind. And you can go to the NASA SOHO website and you can look up, um, so one of them does pictures of the sun in blue and the other one does them in red. And they have a disc that they put over the sun so it doesn't burn out the sensor. And whenever they do capture Planet X, they actually, just like a three-year-old, they do such bad paste lines and they paste over Planet X so that you won't see it. But I have at least 2,000 pictures of Planet X next to the sun. That one right there in the middle line, it had Nibiru, I, I labeled it. You can see that. Um, and, and that's what it looks like, is a winged globe. And um, so now that it's stopped, and, and I will say this, that in the electromagnetic spectrum, if you think about it, uh, that's it, yeah. If, if you think about it, uh, light, uh, let's say heat goes out and it doesn't come back. Yes, you can reflect it back. Um, sound goes out and it doesn't come back, but yes, you can reflect it back. Light goes out and doesn't come back, but you can reflect it back. Ma uh, radio waves go out and they don't come back. And magnetism goes out and it, and it doesn't come back. Uh, there, although, if you understood the way a, a magnet with a South Pole, it's like a, a, like a hollow space where all the positive magnetrons that came out of the North Pole can go in the South Pole. So that's one of the pictures right there on the screen of Planet X captured by the two, the one of the SOHO satellites. And that's the Solar Observatory satellites. And they're called Stereo Ahead and Stereo Behind. And um, so anyway, people, they only leave these pictures up and then for 10, in 10 minutes they put a new picture up. And if they can't get rid of Planet X, they paste over it with the worst paste lines you've ever seen in your life. So. There it is coming into the solar system with its uh, winged globe and just floating there in space near the sun. So it comes every 3,657 years. The last time was the 10 plagues of Egypt. If you go back and you see when the Jews left Egypt and went to the, find the promised land, in Joshua chapter 10, Joshua was in a battle at the time, he was the uh, Jewish general. He said, the sun rose this day and made funny circles in the sky and set in a new dis direction. He says, quote, there never was a day like this before and there'll never be a day like this again. But of course, how would he know? Um, so anyway, this happens every 3,657 years. And the time before that was the flood of Noah, and the time before that was the sinking of Atlantis. And it's been coming here doing this, the planet passing through the solar system for at least two billion years. So although they went to Mars at first, a million years ago they came to Earth, they created all these Adams and Eves, and Google Earth has revealed a city that's 250 miles by 150 miles, right next to the gold fields, in South Africa, and they've dated it from 250,000 years ago. And uh, nobody on the ground had any idea that was such a huge city there with the ruins of buildings, but that's where the gold mining slaves lived. So the Anunnaki came to Earth and pretended to be God. Meanwhile, other extraterrestrial races came here and started uh, modifying us further so that some of us don't have um, uh, atrophied pineal glands um, and uh, right there in the center of the screen there's an island off of New Jersey with Anunnaki symbols on it and it's being gradually flooded by the rising ocean and that's it it's called I think Marshfelder Island or Marshfield Island I'm not sure which and then the pictures uh, to the right of it, it shows the close-up of those designs in the marsh but they're about to disappear which is not really important 
Um, they, they're the ones who great, built the Great Pyramid, and they're the ones that did the Nazca patterns. And these are all things that you could see from space. And I have no way of knowing how to translate that language, but you can see that as the ocean rises, it's flooding that. But right here in the United States, there it is, Anunnaki writing on the ground. Um, and you'd have to walk out into the marsh to see it, but uh, evidently they would fly over and that would tell them something, maybe this way for lunch. I don't know what it says. But um, anyway, so they, they pretended to be God and they required, they created fear. And that's why the Mayans um, and the Aztecs uh, sacrificed people and other races all over the world sacrificed people because in order to to get the gods to do something you had to kill something so one of the most important things Jesus said when he came was you no longer need to kill anything in order to contact God to pray to God you no longer need to kill anything that's why the last Anunnaki God Jehovah who gave the Ten Commandments to Moses that guy uh, that was the it's also called the planet of crossing and sometimes it looks like a cross in the sky and that's one of the pictures of the cross um, so it's here now and it's it can't hit the earth so don't worry about that but in the Atlantic Ocean there's a huge iron bar now you might not have thought about that but the mid-atlantic ridge is the line of mountains from Iceland to Antarctica. And at the peak of that ridge, the Atlantic Ocean is getting wider and wider and iron rich magma is welling up. And as the earth turns, um, as the earth turns, um, planet X is laying on its side with its North Pole 23 times stronger than our magnetic field is pointed at the equator of the earth. And as it turns, it grabs that iron bar in the mid-Atlantic ridge. And there's a slight uh, lurch to the earth. And as it gets closer, when it finally gets 15 million miles away, that magnetic field will be strong enough to grab the iron bar and the crust will separate from the core. Now, nothing affects the core. So the core has its North Pole pointing up and the core is still turning, but the crust will stop. The noise will be incredible. It's in the Bible, in the Quran, other places about the trumpets of the end times. And that will be the sound of the crust separating from the core. And then planet X will be free to leave the solar system and it will pass from below the ecliptic up over the ecliptic. It will pass over the North Pole and as it goes, it will grab the crust and shift it. And when it finally leaves and lets go, Recife, Brazil, the eastern tip of Brazil, will be the new North Pole. And then all the ice in the world will melt. And a new continent is going to arise between South America and Africa. And um, the new sea level, the tidal waves are going to be 700 feet. But in Japan and the UK, the new sea level will be 850 feet. Now I'm gonna tell you something, I want you to write this down. The name of the website is, hey, what's that? But no, no punctuation, just heywhatsthat.com. That is an applet that works with Google Maps where you can zoom in on wherever you live um, and you can see what the sea level, you set the sea level at 850 feet in now this is very, I'll tell you what that map is right there um, in a second, but you, you set the sea level, at the whole world will be 700 feet of water above present, except for Japan and England and Florida, which are gonna sink another 150 feet, and um, the sea level is gonna be 850 feet, but you can check it out for yourself, wherever you live, um, you can put in the numbers, of uh, like you put in 700 feet and then you, you uh, in the red, you can choose to do it in red and it floods the map with red up to 700 feet or in the case of the UK, you wanna do it for 850 feet and you see what's left. And this is a map of the future earth and you see how different it is. 
that map that you were just showing with the lines in it, that's actually, you can print it out, that one. You can print that out on uh, paper any size, and you measure the length of the equator, and you find a ball that has the same circumference. And you cut that out with a scissors, and you can glue it on the ball and look at the future Earth. Can you see how it's designed to do that? It's a very interesting projection. But the new equator is going to go from Alaska to Hawaii and continue. Now, the new North Pole is going to be the eastern tip of Brazil. The new South Pole is going to be the Himalayas. Now, you can read all about what's going to happen in Zetatalk.com. It's all there with drawings, charts, maps, the whole thing. And you would say, how could the South Pole be a Mount Everest if the North Pole is the eastern tip of Brazil? Well, the Pacific is going to narrow and the Atlantic is going to widen. And when that's done, there will be uh, 180 degrees between the North Pole of the eastern tip of Brazil and the South Pole of Mount Everest. So all of India is going to slide under Mount Everest, just like a dresser drawer slamming shut. And there's only two places in the world that are going to rise, and that's New Zealand and Maine. And they're both going to go up 500 feet. And that's why I live on a mountaintop next to the Maine coast. This is going to become an island. Janet and I both love the ocean. We know the sea. We have deer, moose, turkey, um, bear wandering around in the woods. And then down on the shore, we have sea urchins, clams, mussels, lobsters, crab, flounder, bluefish, monkfish, cod, pollock, hake, um, and seaweed. So that's why we chose this place to survive. And eventually, after pole shift, it's going to have the climate of the North Carolina, South Carolina line. You can take a great circle map, <coughs> great circle calculator on the internet, and you can calculate the distance from the North Pole to your house. So let's say you live in London, you can do the North Pole to London, and it gives you the mileage, okay? Then you do a great circle calculation from Recife, Brazil to your house, and that's the difference. And from that, you can um, you know, imp impute the, uh, the lines of latitude and what your climate will be. But we will be in Maine, we get snowy winters. Pretty soon we're going to be 1,200 miles further south from the North Pole. And if it does snow, it's going to melt the next day. And Edgar Casey, C A Y C E, Edgar Casey said that you'll be able to grow citrus trees in New England. So that's why we're here also. So the the fact that the Earth is about to shift to the fourth dimension has attracted unselfish extraterrestrial races from around the universe. And right now, there are 1,000 unselfish extraterrestrial races joined together as a council of worlds. And they're protecting the Earth under quarantine from any selfish extraterrestrials coming here from now on. Because in the third dimension, selfish and unselfish can mix. And you notice that, that in an unselfish family, you'll always have a bad seed, a child who's very selfish. Or in a selfish family, they'll always have an angel that was born. And that's like Janet's situation. Uh, her whole family is extremely selfish. And they, they just uh, abused her and bullied her and, um, and uh, tried to separate her. But in the third dimension, there's mixing all across the universe, the selfish and the unselfish. And there's a technical word for that, service to self versus service to other. Now, uh, when we go to the fourth dimension, only service to other people will be allowed to be reborn on here. And that's the meaning in the book of Revelation that uh, the meek will inherit the earth. It doesn't mean stupid, it means unselfish. And so the meek will un inherit the earth. And, um, and on the fourth dimension, all planets are separate. In other words, if you're a very, very selfish person now and you die, you're gonna be reborn on a planet where everyone is as or more selfish than you are. And um, if you're unselfish, you'll have the choice of being 
born again on the earth. And by that, I mean at least 51% of the time you think of the other person first. So you don't have to be a saint. You don't have to be 99% kind or, or uh, saint-like. All you need to do is the majority of your life, you always, before you do anything, you think, how would somebody else like it if I did that to them? So the earth is going to separate into uh, the, the, all the people that are here are going to either go to selfish planets, and that's 10% of the population, or unselfish planets, not necessarily Earth. And um, that's going to be um, about a third of the population. So what happens to the other 60%? Well, and I, I, I don't know you guys, I don't know you at all, but I doubt you're spending most of your time being kind to other people. I, you know, I don't mean to insult you, but I'm just saying that. And guess what those people are going to have in their next lifetime? They're going to be born as sea creatures, specifically octopuses, uh, octopi. And they're going to live on the bottom of the ocean with great intelligence and great sensitivity and eight arms, but they're not going to have possessions. So... Uh, these are all pictures. There's an octopus. That's right. So that's your future unless you start being um, service to other. And, uh, you know, I, there's not much I can do to help you. The, the thing about your life is that it's not, it's not how long you live. It's how well you live while you're alive and the choices that you make because they will stick with you for a long time. Now, if you're extremely selfish, let's say you go to a nightclub and you shoot everybody you're going to have at least a thousand lifetimes on a selfish planet. And you can't say, oh, I made a mistake. I'd like to be reborn on an unselfish planet where I would have a choice. No, no, no. You're the one who visualized and behaved. Your intentions and your behavior were selfish, and now you're going to live that. So that's what's coming up here. And this could happen within a year. Planet X has been held up, and the Earth changes have been held up, because the Council of Worlds wants massive social change where everyone becomes aware, and I mean everyone, becomes aware that there's about to be a destruction here which could conceivably kill nine out of ten people. So this is not something that you can wish away. You can't wish away low tide and you can't wish away high tide. If you move your laboratory to the low tide mark and think, well, I'm just going to think positive thoughts and the tide's not going to come in and drown my laboratory. You're wrong because this has been happening every 3,657 years. So the Anunnaki came here a million years ago, made slaves. Well, first of all, for 600,000 years, they mined gold themselves. And then he said, wait a minute, we have genetic knowledge. We can breed slaves. And so about 400,000 years ago, and that's why Anthropologists say that every human on earth comes from one woman in Africa uh, 400,000 years ago. That's how that happened in a laboratory on the moon. And there were millions, and each Anunnaki was very selfish. They couldn't even get along with each other. They were nuking each other. Um, the Sumerians didn't like the Mesopotamians, and the Mesopotamians didn't like the Babylonians, and the Babylonians didn't like the Sumerians. And they were always at war. They always married their sisters. Now, a few people that are in the Bible were uh, men of old, or uh, what do they call these people? They, uh, like, for instance, um, Enoch. Now, Enoch's not in the Bible. They took that out. Well, Enoch went up to heaven and was there and wrote a book every day that he was there, 365 books. He was gone a year. He came back, gave the book to his son, and said, I like heaven better, and he left. Well, how could he do that and you can't? That's because he was half Anunnaki. So that's what they're talking about in, in Genesis because these people are 8 to 12 feet tall and they liked the human females and they would mate with them and a lot of them when they became pregnant would just uh, you know explode. They couldn't have a baby that size. And uh, so that's, that's, there's a lot of things in the Bible that, that you know you always wonder about like what does that really mean but the translation from the original phrase is not giants in the earth but men from above and heaven when they asked the anunnaki where are you from well that was heaven but that's not heaven because there is no god there are different dimensions and levels of accomplishment all the way back up to the creator 
there are civilizations that have ascended so far in their advancement that they live as a single thought in space. And if they want to, they can materialize themselves, a flying saucer and one person and fly down and land on your planet and talk to you. And they're holding back from joining the creator. And when everybody progresses to that level, that creator level, and then all the pieces join together, the creator will have taken itself to its own next step. So that's the goal. And we're all linked together. Now, uh, the Zetas, the, the hybrids that they're creating, are going to live 400 years. They're 100% human. They have sex. They can get married. They're, they're a little sleeker looking. There's a couple of pictures of a sleek looking individual in that, in that picture assortment. And you can see that, uh, that they look very much like us, except just a little sleeker, I guess you could call it. Right there, right in the center. Yep. And that was uh, an artist worked with Nancy Leader and the Zetas to draw a picture of what the humans are like. Well, right now, there are millions and millions of them, but they're invisible because they're on the fourth dimension. There could be a fourth dimensional saucer parked in your yard right now, and you could walk through it on your way to your car and not know it because it's a different frequency. But that's the frequency that we're going to have. Now, the, the average hybrid is going to live 400 years. It's going to have an IQ of 300, and it's going to be completely telepathic. So anything it wants to know about anything, it will just ask somebody on this planet, somebody in space, or somebody else on another planet, to explain it to them so they can build it. So this great rush to develop free energy is not gonna work out for you. I hate to tell you this, I'm as scientific as any of you. If I were in your labs, I could probably help you because I've had my IQ measured at 200, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm living on a mountain without plumbing, we're heating with wood, we're ready for pole shift. And the question I wanna ask you is, are you? So this is ahead of us. Now, Crystal had mentioned that uh, there's there have been tales of taking the brain out of the body, rejuvenating it, and putting it back in the body. And wouldn't I well, like that? No, I wouldn't. I, I don't want to be driving around an old Studebaker when everybody else is driving a brand new Mercedes. So if I, I've lived millions of years with Janet. We've been partners in a long time. And I, uh, I am looking forward to being reborn in a more advanced body. And I have no reason that I want to rejuvenate this. I mean, people say I sound younger than I am. I'm going to be 69 in October. Well, that's great, you know. But uh, I'd like to live to be 130, but I'm not going to make any special effort at it. So we're going to have, before during or after the apocalypse, we're going to have open contact with ETs, and they're only going to be unselfish. Now, the ETs didn't want to duplicate their efforts. On some planets, jellyfish have evolved to be more intelligent than any of us, but they can't build themselves spaceships. So they telepathically contacted other extraterrestrial races to bring them to Earth to witness this change of dimension. So this is of great interest to the whole universe, and they're all, they're all helping. And what they've done is they divided themselves so that they didn't duplicate their effort. They divided themselves into 40 working groups. Now, the Zetas are the point of contact in North America. So if you're in Mexico, Canada, or the United States, and you have contact with extraterrestrials, it will be with the Zetas. I think in Europe, the contact is with the Pleiadians, but I'm not sure from the Pleiades. And I, and I don't know who the other groups are, but that's what they say in Zeta Talk, and they don't list them all. So you can, they have their own internal Google search engine in Zeta Talk, so you can, you can um, you know, look up stuff that you're interested in. But they have said that when, that when there are survivor groups and everyone is unselfish, now think about that. Everyone is at least 51% unselfish. They will come and give people technology to help them survive after pole shift. 
And that includes a battery they have that never needs to be recharged. It has a density of 2 million watts per cubic inch. And uh, they're going to hand those out to survival communities um, to help them, um, you know, use tools and whatever that they're going to do. So um, the one thing I wanted to say to you guys, I don't know how I got invited to speak to you. And, um, but I'm glad to be here. And uh, I'm very pleased that I can, that can I spread this message to you, is that life is very short right now. It's possible. Janet had a dream that the first uh, waters from the pole shift coming up on the land are pushing ice flows. And the Zetas, have the, they have not given the date because selfish people would use that to their advantage. So um, they said the pole shift is either going to happen in August, December, or April. And Janet had a dream, a lucid, lucid dream of the first waters coming in and pushing ice. Well, there's no ice in August. It's just starting to form in December. And in April, it's starting to break up. So if that's true, then this would be possibly next April. Now, in the meantime, Planet X, because of its magnetic fields, is causing the Earth to wobble. And if you look at some of those pictures of the stars uh, over the poles, you'll see that they're ovals. And people go, well, that's because they used a wide-angle camera. And no, it isn't. The Earth is actually wobbling. And it wobbles in a way where if you're sitting in front of your computer and you move your head a little bit to the right and then closer to the screen and then go across the screen and then move it away and then go back further away and then come back in again. That's what the wobble is doing. And this wobble is causing this weather because you see that you have, um, the earth moves pretty fast with the wobble because the magnetic field of planet X is making it move. And it's roiling, R-O-I-L, ING, roiling the magma under the, uh, under the crust. So the ground actually is getting water and the o warmer and the ocean bottoms are getting warmer. But the cover-up crowd, the cabal, the selfish ones with all the money, they're the ones that created the lie of global warming so that they could control and tax and that's never going to be revealed because every corporation would go immediately to court and say, hey, we've spent trillions of dollars on cleaning up the air. Well, there's nothing wrong with clean air and there's nothing wrong with clean water, but global warming is a lie. One volcano in, in Iceland can put out enough carbon dioxide to make the whole issue moot. And uh, the Zetas say that every volcano that's been active in the last 10,000 years is going to erupt. And we have plate movement. The St. Lawrence Seaway is gonna be ripped wide open and salt water is gonna flood into the Great Lakes down through the Mississippi Valley to the Gulf of Mexico. And it's gonna separate out the Appalachian Mountains on the East Coast from the rest of North American plate, just like New Zealand sits off of Australia. The west side of Australia is gonna sink and uh, the east side of Australia is going to rise. And um, the Queen, well, every government knows it. They all read Zeta Talk every day. And um, so they whisper this between themselves. But the question is, will there be somebody uh, believable enough to speak out about this? And uh, people, people think, well, maybe I'm a nutcase. Or if you're too smart, there must be something wrong with you. So, um, in any case, I, I think I, I gave you enough, but I'd be glad to come back next session or the session after and uh, discuss any of these things in detail or in part or whole uh, as you wish. But I think I've taken enough time. How, what do you think, Crystal? Are we done okay? You've done very well. Thank you so much, Gordon. This is so informative. You see, I believe that um, we need to have a very open mind in order to progress. And uh, right. I think you have opened up, <laughs> opened up a lot of information here that we all need to seriously think about. And you use the terminology unselfish. I guess um, 
um, we are more used to the word benevolent. What do you think? Benevolent. Well, usually people say malevolent ETs or benevolent ETs. And yes. you mentioned that the, you think the secret space program is going to end and all the scientists are going to announce their free energy. I'm telling you right now, if you actually discovered free energy, the cabal would be all over you like white on rice and they'd steal your ideas and they would never release them because they are trying to build spaceships to go to the moon and Mars to uh, come back as kings of the earth after pole shift. And the Council of Worlds said, oh, no, you don't. This is the final exam as a soul. This is a school. That's your graduating exam. And nobody is cutting class, including the elite and the rich. And every time they build a spaceship that would help them one step further of going to the moon or Mars, the Council of Worlds blows it up. But they've already done it, Gordon. And they've got the, uh, the other ET, the other ET. Yeah, but this is not... Them the population this is uh this is you know they planned originally they built 20 cities that each hold about a million people underground and then they realized with all the plate movements they're going to be trapped in their tombs so now they're th thinking about uh, gated cities in the mountains gated estates and private armies but they're so stupid they don't realize if everybody knows the world has collapsed there's no government no religion uh, there's no banking system. There's no money. And now this guy wants me to be a slave. I'm going to shoot him and take all his money. And the money won't be worth anything anyway. Because we're going to go through a period of bartering. And the ETs are going to help rebuild the earth in a way that you can't even imagine. There's not going to be any more roads. There's going to be uh, all kinds of health care. And, and all this stuff that you want, if you were to create it right now, if I could make a logic line and say all of your research comes to fruition today, believe me, all the remaining selfish cabal would come and take it and kill you. And, and that's your future. So you have two choices. Can you be uh, unselfish and help other people? So in the last five minutes, everybody was born on this planet. They're all going to die on this planet. The question is when. But if you... If you only had five minutes to live and you stepped on somebody else so that you could get further away from the tidal wave that was going to kill you anyway, that would be a very selfish decision and you would go right to a selfish planet. But if in that last five minutes you take somebody who's in pain and comfort them, you've passed the test. That's the test. And you will become a fourth dimensional being in contact with fourth dimensional beings from around the universe. Now on earth, as fourth dimensional beings, as hybrid humans, we are gonna build the fleet of flying saucers and go out into the universe. And the human race from earth is gonna be known in the future as the explorer race. And although it doesn't seem that we've solved every problem because people disagree all day long, I'm really surprised at how divided everybody is. But in the future, what, well, what happened was people on both sides of every issue, slavery, misogyny, you name it, um, uh, religious uh, discrimination, you name it, people on both sides of every issue volunteered to be born on earth to work this out. And believe it or not, it has been worked out. And when we go, in 1,000 years, earth will be abandoned and all the humans will go out on spaceships to all the rest of the universe and we will tell them what they need to know. And we'll land on a planet where they've had exactly the same system for a million years. And they're totally crystallized. And they have no creativity of how can we go one step beyond this. And we'll land and snap our fingers and say, no problem. This is what you do about that. And the goal is to reunite all the planets, all the galaxies, all the civilizations. Um, with the help of humans from Earth. So we're a key element of the future, not only in this little part of the universe, but the whole universe. And we're the greatest explorers. We've learned how to take unbelievable heat, unbelievable cold, disease, um, every condition you can think of, poisoning, um, manufacturing, uh, uh, waste, uh, every situation, doesn't matter what it is. 
And we're the ones that are going to take that knowledge out to the rest of the universe. And we will be known as the explorer race. And so most of what I've told you is from extraterrestrials and, um, and who I believe. I learned a long time ago to use my heart. So when somebody says something to me and it doesn't feel right, I'm thinking that can't be true. But then there's other things. The minute somebody says it, I feel it in my heart. Wow, that is really true. And you can, your soul is always trying to communicate with your body. And you can't really lie. So let's say that I'm going to lie to you. And I say, let me make one thing perfectly clear, just the way Richard Nixon did. He always put his finger on his nose. That's a sign that I'm blocking the energy. You know, if I fold my arms, I'm blocking the energy. If I turn my head and I face somebody else, that means you make me nervous and I'm going to talk, be, I feel more comfortable with that person. So your, your soul will not allow a lie. And if you become really good at body language, you'll learn about this stuff. And so when, when you try and lie, let's say some selfish person survived the fourth dimensional change and they come up to you and they, they're trying to con you. They're trying to, they've got a scheme and you're looking at them and you're going to see their aura. You're going to see that they're lying and you're going to laugh it off. Like, you know, forget it. Don't try and tell me that because I don't believe a word you're saying. So that's why they won't be able to live here. They won't be able to take it. They're going to need to be on a planet where when they lie, everybody else goes, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. So um, right now, like, like um, Bill Gates, who owns Microsoft, he gave a private lecture and nobody was allowed to, to record it. It was $6,000 a head. And if you know anything about the Gates Foundation, they've been really active in vaccines. And this is what he said, because somebody did record it, and it, it's available on the internet. He said, our plan is to sculpt the population using vaccines. And the Zeta said what he plans to do is they'll have FEMA or some other rescue, and they'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll save you. You come and live with us. We'll feed you, and you'll be fine. But you just have to get this one shot before you get on the bus. And it'll be live smallpox or something worse. And, and so that's what he said, sculpt the population. That's the way these people think. They've been spraying the air with uh, aluminum and barium to, to create uh, cloudiness so that you can't see planet X. But the day that everyone around the world looks up and it separates far enough from the disk of the sun that everyone sees it, on that day, mark your calendars because you've got 49 days until pole shift. And that's the only timing they will, will, they will tell everyone. And the question I'm asked the most is, when is pole shift? Well, that's not going to be given out because what they want to do is put bio-warfare toxins in the plains and spray that over the population to get rid of the useless eaters. So we really have to figure out how can we individually survive? If I could help you with your science, I would love to. But I'm more realistic. If I'm ready for apocalypse today, then you can bet sure as hell that I'm ready for it tomorrow. The question is, are you guys ready for the apocalypse? Well, um, we are truth and knowledge seekers here with an open mind. Uh, it's always good to have information. Um, and uh, and it's up to the listeners to take the best and throw the mm -hmm. rest, whatever resonates. And we are here with a mission. Most of us are aware that we are, well, we came here with a divine mission. And uh, yes. we just do, do, do till we drop dead. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, can, we've got can, to be positive, Gordon. You, um, can, we can't you can continue in your next lifetime. We you can't can be frozen with fear. We just got to march on and do what we got to do for humanity. Right. Well, I think if you give some of your time to helping other people, you won't be frozen with fear. You'll be very gratified by how rewarding a behavior that is. And that's exactly what we're doing. So our group right. here is, is I know, developing I know. I... devices to help the masses. And, and as I said yeah. before, free energy is the basis of the um, right. technology. 
some of your group are actually frightened about what might happen if they did get it. And I'm telling you, that's true. That, that's what the selfish people intend. They're watching you like hawks. If you come up with anything, they're going to take it. Period. And we're trying to clean out the cabal now. I mean, you know, there's all these rumors. Well, 87,000 pedophiles were arrested and 100,000 satanic sacrificial uh, dark lords were arrested. Well, I don't know where the evidence of that. I don't see it in the newspaper. Right. But I know a lot of evil out there. But well, right now, the unselfish ETs are trying to help good humans clean that up. Right. So... I can see that we've got help coming our way in the work that we do. If there's such a thing as a galactic federation, galactic councils out there, they oh, would. Oh yeah, whatever you're doing, I'm helping. sure that what you doing, have. Because we have pure heart here. Yeah. You. yeah. Um, I would like to invite you. invite uh, people from the panel to um, pose questions to Gordon and Janet. We have heard so much, and I'm sure we've got many questions. Can I open it to the floor, please? Anyone? Ron, you have a question? Press? Patrick? How about a comment? Patrick, Comments would good. you like to comment on uh, what uh, Gordon's saying about um, whatever he's just said about inventors? Patrick? It's, I'm going uh, to also, uh, Patrick, go ahead if you want. Yeah. It's, I, I don't have any problem with what he's saying, mm -hmm. and I don't have any questions. Right. Okay. Thank you. You know, right. like I said, uh, Crystal is free to give each of you individually my phone number or how to contact me, and you can call me on your own and ask me to discuss anything you want, and I'd be glad to help you as much as I can. Thank you, Garden. That's why we're being brought together because I know we can get some help from you and your contacts, the off-world contacts. <laughs> and it will be very, very helpful with our devices as well, what we're developing. Right. Um, Frez, you're going to ask a, a question. Sure. Go on, Frez. You bet. You bet. Uh, basically, uh, in the last 30 days, we've seen an uptick, uptick in earthquake development in the line of Magnitude. The one here about uh, 48 hour, hours ago was at the furthest end of the, in, on the west, western part of the Aleutian Islands, the seven points. And they haven't had a hit like that in a very long time. The shockwaves from these earthquakes, from the deep uh, earthquakes of 4.5 that started in Indonesia, have worked their way all the way around the Ring of Fire in a progression. It, it has gotten obvious to almost anybody who's following on a daily basis that these pressure just move and they'll build up and it's just like a, a, slip and a grab and a slip and a grab and a slip and a grab and it'll move just so far and then it'll hook something along the way. And it's, it's miserable. What we're seeing is the underpinnings of our plates we live on, the, the crust portion of the planet, it's getting a little slicker, exactly, you know, and, and moving. And uh, I'm going along with your dates of um, in the next few weeks to the middle of August is the first sign. It'll be we've got some aligned planetary stuff coming up just in our closed solar system, but uh, we're coming up on twenty first. Yeah, first is going to be interesting. But we're going to have the first round of it is coming in the next few days. Uh, this will be the king tides in the Pacific Northwest across, you know, another northern hemisphere. Uh, that's going to be our, our first sign of what's to happen in August is what's going to happen during these king tides. And we're looking at Alaska, uh, the west coast of the United States from Vancouver Island clear down into L.A. L.A., the Los Angeles, South California area is super active, but we're actually seeing plate movement from Yellowstone down into uh, Oklahoma City and rarely uh, up the East Coast and then hit twice now, two series in a predictive manner. And there'll be a couple more from the magnitude 7, 7 that hit. It just hasn't arrived yet. Well, that's uh, true. Everything's loosening up and uh, the fracture points are looking like between North and South 
uh, America, uh, basically right there where the <clears throat> Suez, the uh, Panama Canal is in that region. That could easily break through. Uh, and more and than that, the, the, the northern end of South America is going to move 400 miles west. And the southern end of South America is firmly attached to the Antarctic plate. So in order for the northern half to move 400 miles west and crush Latin America, in order for that to happen, there's going to be a huge crack develop in the eastern of, side of South America down. If you see where those big quakes are in Chile and you draw a line to the east, that's where the crack is going to develop to allow. And, and at the same time, the same thing's going to happen on the other side of the Atlantic. The uh, uh, North Africa is going to move east and crush Iran and Syria and that whole area. So uh, you're right. And the plates in the Pacific are like a stack of a deck of cards. And believe it or not, Hawaii's on the top card. So even though they slide together and the Pacific becomes very much narrower uh, and the Atlantic widens, uh, what you have in, in the Northwest is the San Juan de Fuca, I think it's called, plate is sliding under the North American plate. It's sublimating. Sub, 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 <laughs> and uh, the ground is going to get wet and uh, warm. The Indians say that in the past pole shifts, the ground got so hot that you couldn't walk on the ground. And they're saying well, now... Seeing, some of the stuff in the Arctic is the ground warming which is causing the uh, glaciers, two miles of ice, three miles of ice above it, to move toward the ocean. It isn't that Iceland, that uh, Antarctica is getting warm because its average temperature is well below zero most time. And there's been, it's been very, very stable. And when you check their ice core, it hasn't been the seasonal changes in you know, the rings of ice as it's being positive but you're seeing a, a shift and that's basically the ice being melted at the ground level so we've got a uh, the earth right, there all itself, the glaciers the ground are is warming from up underneath yes they're melting yeah. from underneath and that's because the, so, uh, the oceans are getting a little more full because the water warms it takes up a larger volume yeah you that's your your major expansion of your oceans will be the warming of the ocean itself because the molecules spread apart just a little bit uh right. though ice and of course the arctic is already in the water and when it melts it shrinks the amount well, of you, ice that's in did you, did you know that the arctic used to rotate clockwise and beginning this year it started rotating counterclockwise now i never even knew the arctic ice shelf rotated i had no idea but the, the earth wobble caused it to rotate the other way because a giant ridge of ice has built up on the Alaska side of the Arctic Circle and it prevented it from continuing to rotate clockwise. So now it's rotating counterclockwise. And that's oh, recent. Yeah, um, up till, uh, I, I followed the Arctic uh, ice <clears throat> caps, uh, the increase and decrease seasonals, and folks don't realize that a lot of the float ice ends up against Nova Scotia on the uh, eastern side of, you know, uh, uh, up there in the north. Uh, it just can't quite, it, the ice can't make its way to the Atlantic because of Greenland and Newfoundland and, you know, northern Canada in the way. It just kind of blocks it. Uh, the interesting that what I'm saying though is what commenting in, in an alignment with what you're talking about is even if we don't have Nibiru Planet X coming into a system, we are seeing the softening of the grip of the plates on the planet to the core. And so we're 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 beginning to see the the beginnings of this continental shift and uh, the right. progression of the uh, North Pole, the the magnetic north, is increasing. It it's moving basically south rapidly. So anyway, right. I well, that's long enough. that's very observant of you. And uh, and you see what happens is when the Earth wobbles. Now the way it wobbles is this: as the sun rises over the Atlantic, with Planet X being, uh, you know, it's sixty three million miles from the sun and it's thirty million miles from Earth. But as the sun rises over the Atlantic, planet X is next to the sun. 
So it grabs the iron bar and pulls the earth down. So Iceland is moving south and the sun is sitting over the North Atlantic. Well, you can put the sun over the North Atlantic all day long and you don't get any hurricanes. But then as the sun, as the earth turns and the sun goes over the United States and then into the Pacific, there is no iron bar in the middle of the Pacific. So Planet X magnetically lets go of uh, grabbing the earth. And instead, it, the, the North Pole of the earth is repelled by the North Pole of Planet X. And that pushes the North Pole further away. So the sun sits over the South Pacific. So if you've noticed, they're always talking, well, we could have 10 hurricanes in the Atlantic this year. No. The most we've had every year for the last few years is one hurricane in the Atlantic and 81 cyclones and typhoons, which are the same, in the Pacific. And the reason why is because uh, the earth wobble is putting the sun over the North Atlantic during the day over the Atlantic and then during the day over the Pacific, it's pushing the North Pole away. Well, when the North Pole gets pushed away, the earth moves fast but the water hasn't caught up yet. So if you remember, there was a ferry load of high school students going to visit the Hawaii of South Korea, and they set their GPS course and they're headed right for the island, they're heading southeast, and all of a sudden, the boat went 20 miles north and turned on its side and it had been uh, made top heavy, which is always bad, by the owners, and so it capsized and the high school students drowned. Well, that event is an example of the earth wobble because the earth moved um, north, but then the water had to catch up. So as the water caught up, it just took this boat that was headed southeast and just pushed it north 20 miles. And that's why with this earth wobble, you really have, actually, uh, to be honest, you shouldn't trust a GPS ever again in your life. You should get your hands on a map and study it. But so that's what happened in that case. And at the same time now, because of static electricity, the tail of Planet X is streaming towards the Earth, both tails. And as the moons spin really fast and create these little vortices, they become like almost, um, uh, what do you call them, Um, glass fibers, and they transmit the light. So there was a very interesting video of uh, the, there's a thing called the Twin Cities Bridge over the Mississippi. And uh, they were, they had a webcam up there and they were talking about the traffic. And all of a sudden the spotlight moved right down the river and it's on YouTube, you can look this up. Uh, The spotlight moved down, the spot of light moved down the Mississippi across the bridge. And they go, what is that, a helicopter or what? And they had no explanation for at sunrise where this, where this spot of light came from. But that's where it came from is the moon swirls they call it and it creates like a fiber optic cable it transmits the light uh, at an angle to wherever the sun is so you get these spots of light moving across the surface but um, right now the tails of planet x are streaming iron oxide and hydrocarbons into the earth's atmosphere and if you go out and take a picture with any camera it doesn't matter what and you compare it, a picture of the sun, to any other time, you'll see that it looks like there's oil in the air. It's got an oily sheen to it, and it's got a dusty countenance. And NASA, they, such liars at NASA, they said they were sending up five satellites on one rocket to measure the magnetic reconnection flux. But there is no such thing. That's like a, the movie Back to the Future. And so the other day they said, oh, there was a CME from the sun. Well, guess what? The sun's never been more quiet because the South Pole of Planet X sucks up all the uh, magnetic disturbances from the sun. And uh, so what you have is NASA lying that there was a CME and that's why everyone was going to see an aurora, uh, aurora borealis two nights ago. Well, I went out and looked at it and it was pretty faint. But the thing is, is there was no CME from the sun. Even space.com two years ago said, how can NASA say that, that this magnetic storm was caused by a CME when there wasn't any? And that's practically their website. Space.com, usually you can 
trust to say whatever NASA wants it to say, but even they question. And that's because I, there's a picture in that assortment that I sent you, Crystal, that shows the magnetic lines of Earth. And it looks like Earth is having a bad hair day. What happens is the magnetrons come out the North Pole, circle around the Earth to the South Pole, and they color them blue. There's some of the red rain, the dust from the red rain. Um, so uh, then the solar wind blows the magnetic line, so they form, form a teardrop going away from the sun. So you have the Earth with its magnetic flow, and it streams out to a teardrop. And the, the northern lines, these are columns of light caused by discharges of methane that are ignited. And more and more people have been seeing these around the world, which nobody ever remembers growing up and seeing these columns of light. But they're actually discharges of methane be, being ignited. So there's a lot of really strange stuff. And it's all like separate things. Nobody's putting two and two together. But I've been trying to for the public. Um, well, I first went on the radio in 2010. But I've known about pole shifts since 1968. And uh, that's why I moved up here. And I've got Janet on board with the whole thing, too. So, and those are the wobble. That's the Earth wobble, the stars. And that's the announcement in uh, the Washington Post that Planet X had been found. And the very next day, they go, oh, no, we're still looking. We haven't found it. We thought we did, but we were mistaken. When's the last time you heard of NASA and JPL saying that they're sorry they were mistaken? So um, you can look that up on the Internet, too. The announcement that Planet X had been found was December uh, 1983. You know, and, you know what NASA stands for, don't you? Yeah. Never yeah. a straight answer. Right, right. Well, they, they've been trying to cover it up. So um, a, a lot of astronomers uh, w w were trying to discuss it. And wouldn't you know, their car went off the mountain and they uh, all died. And how about that French astronaut? She was at a meeting of all the French astronauts. They had a big table. They were all sitting there. And she broke into the conversation and said, the people have to know. They have to be told. Well, the security cards came and grabbed her, brought her to a me mental hospital. And the news the next day was, unfortunately, she died in a mental hospital. So there's a lot of people who worked for the government, get paid by the government. And when they try and tell the truth, see, I'm just, I'm just some nutcase that lives in, on a mountaintop in Maine. And you can't really believe me. You shouldn't take anything I say as, as being truthful. Um, and, and yet, you know, it all makes sense. And you put two and two together and you look at all these situations. Go to the American Meteor Society, AMS.com. They have a list of fireballs. They're skyrocketing. Uh, that's Planet X when it was first photographed uh, with an infrared camera around 1999 as it approached the solar system. They had to turn the contrast way up. Um, so there's so much evidence of this. And, and if you look into it, you'll really be amazed. You can, you can look up my name, Gordon James Gianni Noto, in quotes, and uh, you'll see all these interviews that people have posted with me talking about this. And then um, you can do Gordon plus Planet X, I'm in there, and then now I guess just Gordon and Janet were on that in the internet too. It just amazes me how they get all this stuff and post it. But uh, no, I'm getting a lot of attention, and uh, I think over a hundred million people have heard me. I've at this point I've probably been on over a thousand uh, different interviews and radio shows in in a lot of different countries, and um, the, you know the 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 Queen of England. The only place that she can possibly survive is Balmoral Castle. So that's why she's about to retire with Prince Philip and go live in, in um, Balmoral Castle. But very little of the UK is going to survive. But I think Balmoral might. I'm not sure what elevation it is. But she's begged the Australian government, can I move the royal family to Australia? They've said no. She begged Obama, can I move the royal family to the United States? And he said no. And, uh, you know, I guess Prince Harry and Prince William bought villages in the mountains of Romania, um, which why are they doing that? Well, pole shift, you know, so all the people, believe me, every single politician around the world knows that. And this global warming treaty with Paris, people are like up in arms. Oh, my God, the United States withdrew. Well, 
first of all, there is no global warming. The air is actually getting colder. Second of all, when the tail of Planet X dumps all this iron oxide into the oceans, the oceans are going to turn pea soup green. The plankton are going to go crazy. And they'll, they'll suck up all that CO2 and they'll use the iron oxide and they'll grow plankton the bottom of the food chain. The first thing to come back is going to be the world's oceans. And, you know, every animal we have on Earth, people are like, well, now we're facing mass extinctions of the animal world. No, they're all, they've all been brought here from other planets. And, and when they originated on Earth, they were brought back to the other planets. So there's nothing that can't be replaced. But uh, the thing to worry about is, is all the nuclear reactors. You know, who's going to clean that up? Well, the ETs have the ability, but they haven't said that they would. Uh, chemical. T yes, darling. Uh, Garden. So you're saying that um, everything will change by April next year? <laughs> well, see, I don't have the date, but I'm just using Janet's dream. Now, do you know that, that they just found a mummy, an al three alien mummies buried in the Nazca, in a cave in Nazca, Peru. Um, they, they dated them 1,700 years ago. One is a human uh, extraterrestrial with a very round face s seen from the front and very round eyes. Well, we never saw that kind of an extraterrestrial, and this is a mummy of one. Um, we never saw this before, uh, you know, like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when it was brought out. There's a YouTube video you can watch called Special Report Nazca Unearthed. And that's, that's what it discusses. Well, the month before that, Janet was laying in bed with her eyes closed and that same extraterrestrial with the perfectly circular head and the perfectly circular eyes appeared to her and pointed his finger at her and said, something's about to happen in the belly button of the United States. And then he disappeared. Wow. Whoa. So let's, so she, have a look, let's have a look at the belly button of the United States then. That's the New Madrid Fault. And see, that was the biggest quake in the United States ever. It was in 1811 and 1812. The Mississippi and the Ohio rivers both ran backwards for three days. It rang church bells in Boston. And uh, so, and you got to realize that, that North America is being squeezed in a giant bow. So Mexico and Alaska are going west, and the point in the center of the bow is San Diego. And that's why there's quakes to the east of San Diego in Oklahoma, is because that's creating a splitting is going on there, a crack. And that quake that just went off in Montana was a layer that was pushed over the North American plate uh, many pole shifts ago. And uh, that, was, that was reacting to the stretching going on under, under. But that wasn't connected. Yellowstone, they've said, even though it spit, the geysers spit lava last week, um, so that it's recharging in the chamber there. But the Zetas say that it will not be a huge supervolcano like it was 675,000 years ago. But Mount Rainier is going to go. Uh, Mount Hood is going to go. Um, you know, and California is going to end up with, um, be known as the California Islands, really. Salt water is going to go almost to Phoenix, right through Monument Valley. It's going to be beautiful. OK. Right. Thank you so much for the information. I mean, I'm, I, I really, I'll say this. I'm a walking encyclopedia. So if you didn't get the right question, ask it at some other point and you'll oh, get that uh, answer. Well, you know, as I said, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we have to be strong and we have to be continuing with the work that we do till we drop, right? Right. Uh, of course, right. at the same time, we don't just blindly go ahead with what we have to do. We have to take heed and be well informed and, uh, well, understand that uh, well, I thought you this asked way me or that way, but, well, we just have to you, go within. You said, have I, have I picked up any devices on the ships that I've been on? And exactly. Asked I've asked you those questions. And I said, 
I said that, no, every time I've gone up on the ships, I talk about the spiritual development of humanity and the future of humanity, but I never went over and picked up any of their devices and unscrewed anything and asked how they worked. But I had, I had hit my head at one point and I was half out of my body and half in my body with my brain. And because of that, I was like, uh, very spiritual it was like i could see the connection between everything i could see the future and um they they picked me up and brought me on board this pleiadian saucer into this room and there was a like a bed like a a, a examining table and they asked me to get on it and these two guys were were almost invisible they were sort of grayish brown you knew they were there and they had little pointy cones on top of their heads. And they reached under the table and they pulled out this tube and they put it right on my forehead and it put my energy body back into my brain. My, they fixed the damage that was in my brain where um, I was seeing too much. I was like a psychic with, that was turned on and you couldn't turn off. And uh, they, fixed, they fixed that for me. So I saw that technology because I was part of it. But still, I don't know what was in that tube or what was on the end of it. But they, 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 and they were about seven or eight feet tall and very thin. They were obviously from some other world. And they pulled out this tube from under this table. And they put it up against my forehead. And I felt this warm feeling. And then all of a sudden, I wasn't able to see everything like I was totally psychic anymore. But you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna speak up a candid comment on this one, Gordon. I'm mm-hmm. going to speak up. I'm gonna say, don't you think they're selfish because they're keeping all these technologies to themselves? They're not helping us by. I mean, okay, you did say that they are waiting to see if um, the scales will tip over. Like if there is going to be fifty-one percent of us who are unselfish. From 51% on, they're going to come, the Zetas are going to come and help us out. They're going to hand yeah. out those uh, uh, transistors, or what do you call that? Those batteries for us. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, and then you're talking about this healing device. Right. Don't you think they have any mercy at all? I mean, like, um, human beings well, are running like I flies, diseases, I, and we are struggling thought- to up with technologies and they've got it why couldn't they help us well, I've, I've thought a little bit about that but because we're a mixed selfish and unselfish world all third dimensional planets are um like for instance the kgb they dropped a book in a field and it was picked up and put on the internet and it's called the uh, alien races pdf and you can read it and they, they're caught they're alien races that the KGB, the Soviet government had contacted and they're all third dimensional. And it's got pictures of the aliens and pictures of the ships and descriptions of what they want to do with earth. And 99% of them are selfish and they just want to take and use and they really don't care. And so they're not allowed to come here anymore, that group, but a very interesting book called The Alien Races. There you go. Janet, I would like to hear what you want to say about this technology because you've been, you've been taken up there all the time yeah. to the ships and to the planet as well, I guess. So you must have right. seen, how do they shower themselves? Do they have to clean themselves with water? How do, they, how do they manufacture their clothes to wear and what kind of food do they eat and do they have manufacturing plants do they grow their the vegetables do they eat meat and things like that we like to know and what kind of technology well, i really never when i'm up there it's usually i'm they show me the children i i don't have the children anymore because i'm getting to, i'm 64 but uh they've showed me the children told Your me children. Their name, my children that i've had with them and i've been doing that since i was probably 17. Wow. Because I, I, before I even knew what was going on, see, I start, I grew up uh, loving UFOs and aliens, and it was always a big part of my life. And uh, I had a cat once that turned into an alien and back into my cat again. So I was used to it at a young age, dealing with the ETs. And shape-shifting. Shape-shifting. And um, when I go up on the ships, it's usually, I can see outside the ships, I can see outside the window or what a porthole, uh, the you know, the glass part of it where you can look out. I can 
love instruments, but it's not like that's the big part of why I'm, why I'm up there. It's more like talking to them and the ETs and um, sometimes Gordon's up there with me and they talk about the technical stuff. But I'm more into the psychic and the um, unconditional love and the um, having the children. And uh, so I don't really, they don't really show me a lot of what they, how, how they eat or, I know they're very thin and their arms are long and very thin, their legs are really thin, they move really fast. But I haven't really seen what they eat. I'm never afraid that they're going to eat me. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I've never felt any no, fear at all. No, I'm fascinated. But I've, with I've them. seen belts that they wear right. that can make them invisible or float them. So they've got some piece of equipment on a belt that they wear around their midst, just like a regular belt. They come to me. They told me they're always around me, which I believe I can go anywhere. They'll, pretty much after a day or two, they'll find me, and I, you know, I, I more or less, you know, I, I'm in communication with them. Um, but as far as the technology and all that, I don't really, they have used a certain wand on me before and hit me over the head with it to try to, to get, to, uh, make it so they could bring me outside into the ship. Well, not hit you. They... No, but... I thought it was going to hurt because I saw him hold it. And uh, they do play it. Do I have a son, and sometimes I'll show him his baby. So, of course, I want to go up to my son. But they do different things in a way that it, uh, there's no fear to it. But it's not really focused on what they eat or. Um, yeah, and my, visits, my visits didn't concern any of that. If I had met you 30 years ago, then I might go on a ship and go, hey, yeah. 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 May, may I have a visit to ask you to answer them this question? Yeah, what happened? But, uh, but I'll tell you this. They have... What is that noise? You can get back to scratching. But but I'll tell you this, Crystal. It's clear to me. It's clear to me. Yeah, I can hear you. It's clear to me that that uh, they have every technology that you could ever dream of, and that they're only going to give it when the earth is is the only people left on earth are those who are kind and live by the golden rule and except for that no selfish person even even communities where there's a lot of selfish people they're not going to come and help them at all you've got to have a community of entirely unselfish people so that's part of your task too is if you're going to go somewhere where you can survive you've got to surround yourself with people who are kind Okay. And then they will keep you. Right. I understand that there's a group of people who call themselves libraries. Like, just watch. Okay, there. again. Right. Light warriors are the doers. They know, they're awake, and they do. Okay, and they make things. For example, I believe our group, Physig, are the doers, the light warriors. And, and they're uh, very old souls. You see, what a young soul doesn't know anything and isn't interested. And the more lifetimes you live, the more you become interested in everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, there's nothing that doesn't interest me. Right. You know, so, when I'm talking about the ETs and you talk about how they clean themselves, I see it more as nature, you know, like animals take care of themselves. That's how I'm seeing them, that they, it just gets done. They have their own ways. Yeah, their own ways. So I don't really study the animals in everything they do. Or how they take care of themselves and to me that's sort of how the ets do it you know there's nothing mysterious well when about they it. when they take us up it's so that they can talk to us so yeah. we're not there like going through their laboratory and their repair shop and we're not right. you know uh, everything's all working and they want to communicate with us but and, I'm, uh, I'm sure they can see the big picture. They can see what's going on here on this planet. I, oh, I'm yeah. sure they can see there's foul play here that certain okay. factions of the uh, uh, galactic ETs have been uh, 
taken over control here and uh, and and we had been enslaved and uh, things had gone so bad that why couldn't they interfere is there is there a non interference no they can't do that that's a good question and it's because of karma they cannot if they were to start interfering uh, on earth in other words they can give you ideas and inspiration and encouragement but they can't come and hand you something or give you something or come down and fix something or save you if somebody's going to kill you they can't come down and, and and save you like that anything that would be interfering with people they can't do that, that but i'm but, sure they have the ability to do a hawking scale on us who is genuine who is having a pure heart who is um, actually knowing that they have a divine mission here to help humanity out and who can save a lot of people so if they know that and they have a device or rather they have their psych psychic ability to do a hawking scale on people then they would be able to single out who they can help to help the masses of oh, that well let me just say and i hope i'm not offending anybody Stephen Hawking is an idiot. <laughs> he is he is so self-involved and selfish. I can't believe the things that come out of his mouth. But uh, I so I don't know what you mean by a Hawking scale. But I can say this: Janet and I are both able to see auras. So everywhere we go, sometimes we'll see somebody walking down the street with like a ball of white light all I'm around them. I'm talking about Stephen Hawking. <laughs> I'm talking about a scale where they know who has the, uh, what do you call that, the purity of heart, the unselfish. Well, that's what I'm trying to say is the earth is surrounded by clouds of violent selfishness and greed, and it's a dark planet. And all the people who are unselfish actually have white auras. They're like candles in the darkness. So the ETs cannot possibly miss who is and isn't spiritually advanced and good and cares. Mm -hmm. So, um, just like Janet and I, when we see people like that, we go right up to them and talk to them. And we've met some of the most spiritual people just anywhere we are. Uh, every so often, there'll be somebody that's just surrounded by this ball of white light. And we go, wow, this person is really advanced. And, right. and okay. when we go see them, you know, yeah, it's like... Sure. I'm it's sorry like, to cut short because, you know, time's running on and yeah. I can't have the recording more than two hours. I, I want to say, uh, Gordon, that um, uh, here we have this, this group, physique group, uh, with scientists and researchers and enthusiasts and developers of uh, free energy technology, which is the basis of the things that we require and need to heal and to, well, you know, to free humanity, basically. So we want to be able to have some help from Anne in order well, to first get of all what you we have, have to do, to what we came here to do. You, first they way. cannot help anyone unless they ask. Okay, so we have asked on behalf of physique, okay, I have asked, no, it, and I, if they ask. can't interfere, what I'm saying, if they can't interfere with the technologies, at least help us advance with ours. And uh, can, and offer us with some protection, and so we can get on with uh, what we have to do. Well, it's possible, for instance, if somebody were to take a gun and shoot you, that they would jam the bullet in the gun so it there didn't you come are. out. The gun. You see, you they see. can. But, yeah. they're, but they're not going to take that person and move them to Alaska. Well, I'm putting this but, challenge to them. I think they're selfish if they're not helping, and they have all these technologies. We have. So they can't do anything unless we ask. Well, we ask. Now we have started no, to ask Jack. Each, each of you has to go out by yourself at night, look up at the stars and say, uh, really, I'm very interested in receiving help from unselfish ETs and uh, to guide me in my work. And you'll be surprised at what happens. Well, we've been asking all of our lives with our prayers. Anyway, I'm sorry, folks. I don't mean to have a conversation with Janet and Gordon alone. I have to open it to the floor and go around the table now. <laughs> I beg your pardon. We got so carried away. Uh, okay, we're going to start off with uh, Patrick. Patrick, well, I did ask you, and you said you go along with uh, the information, but would you like to, do you have anything that you want to say before we close the meeting? Uh, no, thank you. I'm quite happy with what's been said. Oh, thank you, Patrick. All right. Uh, next, All right. we go to Fraz. Fraz. 
Press. Okay. Uh, Unmute. Yeah, we've uh, we've kind of delved pretty deep in a couple of areas where I've already uh, talked, and so um, I'm going to let the floor go to somebody else. Thank you very much for being here. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank, thank you. you for having us. Yeah, oh. This has been fun wait, for wait, us. Wait, no, I hadn't finished yet. We hadn't gone around the table yet. That's Ron. Ron. Well, I'm thanking him. Thank you. Ron, where are yes. you, bro? Yeah. I'm here. Oh, uh, good. I'm sure you have lots of questions for Gordon and Janet. They've been no, very, actually, very actually, informative I don't. I, and uh, insightful. You don't? I, in fact, some of the some of the things uh, I think I was aware of uh, many, many years ago because I remember one thing that Gordon said tonight. Uh, he said that uh, that uh, uh, Phoenix might be the next uh, seaport, or the ocean would be close to Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. And uh -huh. I believe it was about, oh my God, how long ago was it? Must have been 15, maybe 20 years ago. Jean Dixon, who was kind of a psychic in her own right, uh, yes. she said she said that Phoenix would be the next uh, Phoenix would be the next major seaport in the world, and she didn't give a date or anything like that. But uh, she wasn't always right on her on her projections of the future. But uh, that was one of hers that I remember. She said. Uh, uh, many, many years ago. Thank you, Ron. Well, the, the Mississippi is going to rip all the way over, and Edgar Casey, who died in 1945, said the largest seaport in North America in the year 2100 would be Omaha. Really? Well, that's, that's the land of, what is that, UPS or FedEx, uh, where they've got their operations? Well, you know, uh, Dick Cheney was trying to buy an aircraft carrier for Wyoming, and people were like, what the hell is he talking about? And he came within three votes in the Wyoming legislature to buy a used nuclear aircraft carrier, which, of course, he couldn't move off the Mississippi until the apocalypse, till the flood. But when the sea level rise or whatever, the Red River is going to flood all the way into Wyoming, and he could bring the nuclear aircraft carrier. And of course, he's one of the most selfish people on earth. And uh, he wanted to have his own castle with uh, nuclear power, a hospital, 5,000 peons and jet fighters and bombs and s hold off everybody. I think, a, I think a Starcraft would be much nicer than an aircraft carrier. Well, you know, he's Dick Cheney. He doesn't really... See, the, the selfish extraterrestrials are the first ones that, because there's selfish Zetas and there's unselfish Zetas, just like every group. And the selfish Zetas are the ones that contacted the US government and made deals and they promised, whole shift's gonna come, we'll take you to boot bases in the moon and Mars and you'll be safe and then you come back as kings of the earth and we'll trade you, give you all this technology and um, they lied because the selfish ETs lie. That's what they do. And the selfish people they were dealing with believed it all. Now they're in a frenzy because they realize, geez, they aren't going to take us to the moon and Mars, and we're going to have to survive here. We may have to roll up our sleeves and plant our own garden. So. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank um, you. And M Mars? Mars Leno. Can I? Unmute you now so you can speak up. You have any question for Gordon and Janet? Mars? No, I, I, I'm just full of this information now okay. and just uh, processing it with what I, I am at. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, just to say thank you and to encourage everyone to have an open mind. Uh, not to judge any any of the things that are happening for at times i think we're still at the tip of the iceberg on That's on right. all the on all the on all the things too so just uh, glad to be here and thank you and thank you very much mars for thank your you for having us lovely too. comment yeah all right so um there being no other business i would like to close the uh meeting uh the next meeting as i said uh, uh, patrick will be speaking the next meeting and i wish that all of you would be joining us again because it's going to be a very interesting very exciting talk um as you know who patrick is if you go to 
Patrick's website. Patrick, would you would you say out your website for all to hear so they they can go into your website if they're true free energy enthusiasts? Oh, they can't miss out on your website. Um, okay, I'm I'm going to share screen so I can show you Patrick's website that is already on the uh, True Vision of Peace uh, physics site. Okay, I'm going to share screen so you can find it. <clears throat> Here you are. Um, I'll click share screen now. Oh gosh, no, I can't see my share screen. Okay, there it is. All right, so here it is. If you go to physics website, this is this is where everyone's here. <laughs> uh, this is Patrick's site. If you click on uh, free energy uh, reference information, you'll be able to see Patrick's site. This is Practical Guide to Free Energy Devices, and Patrick has meticulously written three or con and compiled uh, all the free energy devices in the world in 3,300 pages in his website. Wow. It is wow. like he's like a walking encyclopedia. So do come like to it. physics next meeting. Mm. Yeah, and some of the world's top most renowned uh, free energy scientists, developer, enthusiasts uh, would have referred to his um, compendium of free energy devices. He's a great man. Well, but I will say. I will say one secret that I finally got out of Nancy Leader from the Zetas that sure. magnetism controls gravity and gravity controls light. So use that however you can. Thank you very much. So there being no other business, this meeting is now adjourned to no, August, the second. August second is the next one. Say that again. August second is the next meeting. August the second. Uh, that's on Wednesday as well, of course. Um, it's the first and third Wednesday of the month. Okay, of the month. Okay. First and third Wednesdays of the month, and uh, Patrick will be presenting on the fortieth physic meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you for speaking in our thirty ninth meeting, Gordon and Janet. We thank you very pleasure. much. Yeah, it, it's such um, <laughs> a very insightful information that you have given us today. Thank you. And thank you me, if I had five million in my own laboratory, I'd build a flying saucer and take off right now with Janet. And I wouldn't I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> well I'll catch up with you too. Okay. <laughs> Privately. Thank you so much indeed. Much love. Namaste. 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 Namaste.